on a Wednesday night. I'm Claire Maxed from Wild Ginger Running and I am delighted to be here tonight with none other than Grand Round Completer, John Kelly. Hey John, how are you doing? Doing all right. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for coming on. There's lots of people listening tonight live um, and catching up later as well. It will be available as a podcast tomorrow. Um, so just for anybody who has been, uh, may, who's maybe a beginner to trail running or has been living in a cave for the past year or so since you came to the UK, uh, could you just, just explain for people what is the Grand Round? Uh, so the Grand Round is something that I, I kind of entirely made up, uh, name included. So there's the three uh, big classic fell running rounds in the UK, the, the Paddy Buckley Round in Snowdonia in Wales, uh, the Bob Graham Round in the Lake District in England, and the Charlie Ramsey Round uh, in the, the Lockerbie area of Scotland. And uh, so each of these, kind of the, the general goal, uh, is to complete them in, in under 24 hours uh, by themselves. And so I had the idea uh, in wanting to kind of combine a couple of my passions and, and see as, as much as I, I could um, while I'm here of uh, combining the three and doing them consecutively and riding my bike in between them. Uh, so this in total uh, amounts to about uh, 400 miles of, of cycling, uh, about 185 miles of running uh, across 113 summits with uh, 85,000 feet of ascent. And no, no mean feat. And you called it the Grand Round 2.0. Um, and just fill us in on, on why that is. Uh, so I, I attempted this last year in 2019, shortly after I moved to the UK. Uh, it was uh, one of those things where I, I planned as, as best I could, um, but with kind of no one having done it before. Uh, it, it's it's difficult to uh, have a, a perfect plan right off the bat and, and so I, I did as best as I could uh, I fell a bit short I, I did two of the rounds and uh, stopped on my bike on the way to Scotland uh, and uh, kind of took all of the lessons learned from that failure and, and formulated a, a new plan for it uh, a, a, greatly improved one and and so I, I called that my my 2.0 plan fantastic and we have got some questions about what lessons you learned and took through to the second experience um coming up um but um i just want to dive a little bit into what your inspiration was for doing this round because you also did it um you fundraised as well for a really amazing charity the stephen lawrence trust so um what was the inspiration behind doing such an epic um, uh, just basically thing that you made up as soon as you came to the UK? Uh, so it's it's always, uh, you know, I've always wanted to set goals that really force me uh, to, to push my limits and to reach as, as far as I'm capable of. I, I think ideally uh, a, a goal is, is one that we can just barely reach. Um, but if it's not perfectly at that spot, I would actually have it a bit farther uh, than I can reach to, to keep me going as, as far as I can. Uh, and, and so this really appealed to me as something that would do that. And on top of that, something that uh, I could really get excited about and motivated about and that would keep me going uh, all the way to that limit. Uh, so I, I was really intrigued by the idea of doing these rounds, exploring uh, these, uh, to me, uh, new regions, and uh, again, being able to combine that uh, with my, my passion for mountain running alongside my passion for cycling. 
it certainly was an epic challenge and it, it was brilliant to see how much you raised and and just brilliant to see, follow you for those kind of five and a half days um, we've got tons of people watching so I just want to just give you a, a little um, flavor of, of how many people are watching live so we've got John Airy, Di Wilson, Simon Lakin, uh, Graham Band, Phil Haddock, Hannah Baisley, Tom Avery um, he's over in the States and John Gardner he's in the States as well um, we've got Guy, we've got Abby, we've got Tom um, we've got Conrad, he's over in the States too, Mr. Whippet and uh, Chloe, Leon um, and Run to the Hills. Oh, that's John um, uh, Kynaston as well. Um, so that is um, absolutely fantastic to have everybody watching. Thank you for tuning in. Um, so we've got a first question here from um, one of my patrons, Guy Adai Wilson, um, who says to you, John, congratulations on all that you have achieved. Um, he's got a few questions for you here this evening, um, but the first one he wants to ask about was um, how did your planning um, with your previous experience on the last round how did the planning this time kind of match up to what you're expecting to happen and, and were there any major issues because from reading your Instagram mini blogs um, it sounds like there were quite a few um, a few little glitches along the way like uh, especially on the bike with all those road and tunnel closures yeah, there, there were a few hiccups. Um, there are always going to be, uh, in anything of this nature, of, of this length and with this many variables, there are going to be uh, unpredictable things that happen. Uh, and so I, I had a bit of buffer built into my schedule in a couple of spots uh, that ended up getting used by, for example, the, the road closure uh, on the second bike leg. Um, some uh, less than uh, some undesirable weather uh, on Bob Graham round uh, that I, I kind of again used a bit of my schedule to get some extra sleep after that uh, but really uh, things kind of stayed good uh, up until uh, part way into the Ramsey round when uh, Storm Ellen hit and I uh, wasn't able to continue on pace through that. Uh, so my, my goal was to do the entire thing in under 20, 120 hours with each round under 24 hours. Um, but once Storm Ellen hit on the Ramsey round, it became more a matter of, of finishing and finishing safely. Uh, and so I, I fell way behind my schedule and ended up finishing uh, in about 130 hours. But otherwise, uh, each kind of section of my schedule, each of the bike legs, each of the, the Patty and, and Bob Graham legs, uh, they, they really kind of, of went to plan. And so that, that was good. Yeah, and I read in your blog that you had about 10 layers on, on the Ramsey round towards the end, and just it was really hard to, to keep warm. Yeah, I just, uh, when your body is that depleted, it, it kind of loses the ability to regulate temperature. And, and so it was kind of at the beginning of, of, of the Ramsey round, my, my body was fighting um, on the fronts of fatigue and sleep deprivation. Uh, and it was, it was managing that. But then once a, a third front was opened up with the extreme cold and wind and rain, uh, it wasn't able to do all three of those at, at once. And so other people were uh, with me in, in much less clothing, uh, but my body just uh, wasn't able to, to handle that in its current state. So I, I had something like um, I had a base layer, um, two mid layers, and then seven jackets, three of them Gore-Tex. Um, and, and so it became wow. a, a there, there's no telling how many times I, I unzipped and zipped the zippers we you know we would do a climb that was sheltered from the wind and I would undo seven zippers and then we'd get to the top and I would <laughs> zip them all back up so it was kind of a uh, manual regulation of my my body temperature that I had to do there yeah wow and yeah and you were really depleted we'll get onto the sleep deprivation and we'll get onto the food um in just a moment but I just um there's another question now from John Kynaston who wants to know about um well first of all he says I'm really looking forward to this one um which discipline did John find harder the running bit or the cycling bit 
so the main goal of this was to do uh, the three rounds in under 24 hours. Uh, the cycling I, I had on the schedule, uh, kind of 24 hour blocks, but that was so that I could do the cycling and then on the front and back end of that and possibly in the middle uh, have blocks for sleep. Uh, and, and so um, that's, that's what I did and I largely viewed the cycling and, and tried uh, to approach it as a, um, a very unreasonably long recovery ride between the rounds. Uh, and, and so I, I tried to keep my effort level down on those um, and any speed that I gained there was really uh, just a bonus to be able to get more sleep. Uh, so the, the running was definitely the uh, main part of the challenge uh, and, and in particular, uh, you know, w once you're up there uh, on, on the tops in, in the kind of weather that I had. And it's pretty impressive. I mean, bike one, 16.7 miles an hour average, and then bike two, um, 17.6 mile an hour average. That's that's just so impressive within an epic challenge like this. And I'm also surprised coming from a triathlon background that you didn't put in a little swim, like maybe across Derwent Water in the middle of this. Did that not appeal <laughs> to just make it into no, a grand that's, triathlon? No, uh, that's the, my, my relationship with swimming is one of the main reasons I love to triathlon. So uh, th this this was again something where I could kind of put together the two elements of that that I enjoyed uh, while ditching that third part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> um, and so just talking about your training then, um, got a question on the live chat from um, new patron Adrian Orange. Hello to you. So um, he says, uh, um, John, um, how does he train? Is it based on his pace, his HR zones? Like, do you stay within aerobic capacity or do you, do you just go by how you feel? Um, what would you say? Uh, so it's it's almost an entirely uh, feel, so relative perceived exertion, uh, I guess is the technical term for it. But uh, I've I've never used heart rate in training. Uh, there are, in my opinion, far too many variables that uh, affect it. Uh, I don't like wearing a chest strap, and and the little wrist based heart rates things are uh, fairly unreliable. Uh, so I, I do use heart rate um, to look at resting heart rate and be sure that I'm not overtraining and, and that I'm recovering properly. Uh, but w when I'm actually out there in workouts, you, you know, your goals in races and, and whatnot are, are time-based, um, not, not heart rate-based. So I kind of go for the same thing in workouts and I'm able to adjust based on uh, how I feel uh, on a particular day. And coming into this, did you have a, like a particular mileage that you had each week to do or like a particular ascent? Um, can you even train for something of this magnitude? No. So uh, again, th there's no magic number to hit um, in terms of weekly mileage or ascent. Uh, setting those goals can, can be quite motivating uh, to try to keep us going on any given week uh, and, until we hit them. Uh, so uh, they're quite useful in that regard, but it's it's not like um, training 80 miles a week is going to get you there, and training 79 miles a week is is not. Um, there, there's no magic threshold. It's it's continuous, um, and so to be honest, these days I I mostly do uh, what my coach uh, David Roach lays out for me, uh, and so that's that's been a big stress relief uh, to, to not have to worry about that myself. Mm. And is it easy to fit that in around your work? Because I know you've got kids as well. It's like, how does that work? Have you got any tips for anyone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, back in the days when we were going into offices, um, uh, pretty much all of my weekday miles were as my commute, uh, which that's something that I've done for five years and uh, is really the only way that I've been able to fit my training in. Uh, now that there is no commute, uh, I guess the time that would have been taken for that uh, is, is otherwise used for training. Uh, but it, it also comes down to uh, quality over quantity. And I'm, despite doing some of these things, I'm uh, multi-day continuous challenges. I'm not what most would consider a high volume uh, ultra runner in terms of training. I'm, I'm doing 
60 to 70 miles a week. Um, you know, guys like Jim Walmsley are out there doing twice that. Yeah, so do you really recommend getting a coach then? Has that been a real weight off your mind, it seems? Uh, it it kind of depends on each person's preference and, and where they are uh, in their development. Early on, it's uh, to be honest, it's fairly easy to just go put in the miles um, and then throw in some higher intensity uh, occasionally and you can get extremely far with that just by going out and, and putting in the miles um, and the best thing that a coach can do there is be sure that you're not overdoing it and uh, burning yourself out or causing injury or getting into overtraining territory uh, but once so, so I I just picked up um, David as my coach uh, about a year and a half ago, and before that I was entirely self-coached, uh, which worked pretty well, um, but I felt that I was starting to kind of plateau and, and reach a point where uh, I wasn't going to be able to get those that, that last bit of improvement and, and optimization uh, by myself. So for that, I, w I would definitely recommend a coach. And also, just to, again, if you're like me and you, you don't have time to really plan your own training or if it stresses you out, uh, it's, it's great to not have to worry about that and to be done with my workout each day and think, well, that's it. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry, like, was that enough? Should I do more? Should I have done something different? That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, well, it definitely works, didn't it, this time? Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, so just um, a little bit on the, like, not the physical side of training, but the mental side of the training. Um, we've got a question from Paul Hamilton here, um, and he asks how you train mentally for challenges um, like this, like the Pennine Way, like the Barclay. Um, and he says, can he offer us runners trans transitioning from marathon distance running to ultras any advice about the mental challenges that we will face and how you overcome them so that's um you know each of those experiences builds upon e each other um and so every time I'm, I'm doing one of these things i'm able to draw from uh those previous experiences from those low points i've hit from the highs that i've hit from the challenges that i've faced uh and and really the the biggest um, thing I, I offer people who are transitioning from uh, more reasonable distances uh, <laughs> is something that was told to me very early on is, is that it, it doesn't always get worse and, and when you're doing uh, marathons and shorters it, it's kind of a, a gradual degradation throughout the race you get more and more tired um, kind of continuously almost linearly um, and and that's that. Whereas in an ultra marathon, uh, you can go down, and then you can bounce back up, and go down again and bounce back up. And so you have all of these peaks and valleys uh, that you go through. And it's very important when you're in one of those valleys to remember that it's it's not a continual decline. Uh, it, it doesn't always get worse, and and you can pop back out of that. Uh, and, and be fine again and, and you just have to be able to push through that that's really good advice isn't it like don't quit at the first down point just keep going and, and things might get better um, and um, I'm interested also about what gear you found really helpful during this especially um, I know you're sponsored by La, La Sportiva and um, so you wore the mutants um, but did you um, did you take different pairs or did you have um, you didn't use different anything but the mutants for each one um, and uh, yeah what what kind of what was your gear essentials would you say yeah so I, I've uh, the mutants have been my go-to for steep technical terrain um, for a, a number of years now. Um, I, for the Penine Way that I, I did uh, a few weeks earlier, uh, I used the Jackal, which uh, you know is, is more cushioned, uh, but isn't as stable, isn't as good on the steep technical terrain. So for the rounds, I, I did stick with the mutants the entire time. Uh, I had a pair for Patty Buckley, I had a second pair for Bob Graham, and then for Charlie Ramsey I, I switched back to that first pair um, to 
you know, kind of give them a chance for the, the cushioning to uh, <laughs> recover uh, itself uh, from from the earlier round. Uh, outside of that, I, I had a uh, an ultimate direction uh, race belt with, with an adventure pocket, so just kind of a, a waist belt that allowed me to keep my schedule, some uh, basic essentials, electrolytes, uh, my tracker, that, that sort of things, things that uh, my, my pacers weren't carrying in their larger vests. Um, and those were really the, the two key elements other than my, my actual clothing, uh, which varied quite significantly uh, depending on the weather. Uh, I did, um, Koro sent me a, a Vertex, um, which I, I actually have here to, to use for this, which um, the primary appeal of that was the long battery life. Uh, it, it almost didn't make it through uh, the Ramsey round with as long as I took, um, but that's because I had the heart rate sensor on. Uh, if I had turned that off, it would have would have had plenty of, of battery for it. Or oh, what, for the whole 130 hours? No, so I think the battery life is rated at like 60 or 70 hours um, if you turn the heart rate sensor off and you know don't use the backlight and do everything perfectly um, and so the Ramsey took me 34 hours and 43 minutes and with the heart rate sensor on it was uh, it was pretty close to dead by the end of it yeah they're really good for battery life aren't they they're a real game changer i found um and uh, did you have um uh, some poles as well um I, did i see we using some poles yeah i uh used those uh gradually more and more uh throughout the challenge um patty buckley i i really only used them on a few of the the biggest climbs um used them a bit more on bob graham and and then for uh for Charlie Ramsey, they kind of doubled as crutches, and I uh, <laughs> had them pretty much the entire time. Uh, so those were the uh, the ultimate direction uh, collapse, collapsible uh, FK poles, um, which uh, they're they're quite sturdy and, and lightweight, and I, I enjoy the the grip on them as well. So um, those were good. Yeah, awesome. Um, and it's uh, just going back to what you carried around your waist um, and how you had paces carrying the other things for you. Um, I was just really struck by your, um, I think it was your first post that you wrote about completing the challenge and you wrote that it was the furthest from solo as anything I've ever done in running. Um, and you wouldn't have even made it out of Wales without support. So um, I just wanted to ask you how important that support team was, because there must've been a lot of people up and down the country supporting you on that um just how important is that side of it because we always see this you know this great person's done this great thing but you forget there's probably about 30 maybe even 50 people behind that yeah so that that was incredible um and it, you know th there there are solo challenges which i've i've done a lot of um particularly that's mostly what i did back in the u.s uh and then there are these challenges that that really um th there's uh, they almost require support um, to, to do these all, uh, to even have a shot of sub-24, uh, to be able to make it between the rounds. Um, there's really just no way that I, I could have seen doing the solo. Um, and so uh, th that was uh, out there on the rounds. They're, they're helping. Well, they're mostly uh, doing the navigation uh, and, and carrying things so that I'm you know mentally I can focus on just keeping myself moving forward um, and then uh, this year I also had uh, riders with me on the bike legs and, and then also people on the road that uh, were carrying kit and food and um, a few spots where there were was a, a van available that I could take a nap on the bike if need be uh, and, and then even going uh, into uh, the Charlie Ramsey round, uh, Martin Stone was my main road support, and he is uh, a, a legendary fell runner himself. And I, I don't know that there's many people that could have uh, organized the support he did um, as quickly as he did uh, and adapt to the conditions the way that he did uh, when I fell behind schedule. And again, the, the named storm hit. 
uh, and out there uh, in those conditions. I mean, I had an, an all-star cast of, of Scottish Hill Runners uh, with me. The, the final leg of, of Charlie Ramsey, uh, Finley Wild was with me, who uh, just, you know, we, we probably took as long on that single leg as he just did the entire round in um, the <laughs> yeah, other day. Yeah, he's just broken the Ramsey round record, hasn't he? Yeah, he took, to him. A, he took an hour and a half off of it. Wow. Um, it's so good. that's that's just, it's it's incredible to, to have people out there uh, like that in all sorts of conditions at all times of day uh, supporting this challenge and, and really uh, wanting to, to see it through and, and help uh, accomplish it. Yeah, it's just fantastic, isn't it? I think everyone loves it. They love turning out to, <laughs> I don't know whether they like to just see so, someone in so much pain or, or whether they just like a nice day out on the hill. But but it seems like um, you're all having a good time. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and, and I've, I've, I've heard the, the, the joke about the we like to see other people suffer um, <laughs> quite a bit, but I, I think that really people just uh, do view these as, as collective achievements and collective limits and, and they want to see uh, how far uh, we can uh, push things. Yeah, as human beings, just how far can we go? Um, and, and Hannah Neal, um, one of my patrons, she says, I literally can't think of any questions. He's just on another level to us mere mortals. Um, and she wants to know about, um, about two things, the sleep deprivation and the pain. So. Uh, she wants to know how you keep going through the sleep deprivation because I think overall you had just around about 12 hours sleep in the 130 hours, which is, which is incredible, um, and uh, and the pain because you had um, there was a problem. Your ankle tendon was was really hurting as well, and it, and you said in one of your blogs you were reduced to a one-legged hobble coming coming down the final ascent, the final descent um, on the Charlie Ramsey round. Um, so she just wants to know. Um, is this something you just learn as you move up in the distance or are there like particular strategies that you use and she says this is coming from someone at completely the opposite end of the ultra spectrum to him she's just beginning in ultra running and, and she's um, yeah she's just uh, absorbing the new challenges as they come so sleep deprivation is, is something that really affects people at, at all ends um, the, the same uh, it, we, we all, all need sleep uh, and there's really no way of getting better at it. There's no way of training yourself to need less sleep. Uh, you can learn kind of what, how your body is going to react when it doesn't have sleep, and, and you can learn uh, how to manage that. Uh, but the, the most important thing I've learned on that is, is kind of how to optimize uh, my naps and the sleep that I am able to get, and that's something that is kind of unique to each individual in, in terms of how they respond. Uh, so I've kind of developed the approach where uh, there's prevention and, and then mitigation. And, and so for prevention, I'm, I'm making sure that I, on these multi-day adventures, I'm, I'm getting uh, a, a good, well, good <laughs> sleep um, e each night. So generally an hour and a half to three hours, uh, even if I'm not to the point where I'm falling over, um, standing up, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I need to get that early, because if I dig myself in too big of a hole, then there's just there, there's no way of, of getting out of it. Uh, but then when those moments do come, that for me, I feel like I can just, um, you know, fall asleep and faceplant on the trail uh, where I am. Uh, those, I, I do uh, try to get, like, 15 minute power naps that can really do wonders to refresh your mind generally for a, a couple of hours and, and so I, I took uh, two naps during Ramsey um, one of them just kind of laying there in, in the heather on the side of a, a hill uh, those those did quite well and uh, also I, I probably have the bad weather uh, to thank for keeping me <laughs> awake yeah. a bit more on the Ramsey <laughs> Um, hard to fall asleep when you're getting pelted in the face by rain and high winds and freezing. Um, <laughs> and you even and, did that yourself, didn't you? I read on one of your blogs you, you you spray you actually spray yourself in the face with a water bottle so that you it's one of your staying alert tactics. You say. Yeah, um, that 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 worked particularly well um, on 
the bike where I had a short stretch um, where I was starting to feel drowsy and I, I had cold water uh, in my bottle. Uh, generally, though, on the bike, if I started to feel that way, I would reach the van or support point and uh, take a quick nap, uh, which is what I did there. I, I needed that to make it a few miles um, to the support point. Um, she also asked about the pain, and, and to be honest, um, it's just kind of a matter of learning what pain is um, kind of a, a risk versus what pain is just there. Um, and, and there's a big difference. Uh, some, some pain you can push through, and, and some, whether you can or can't, you, you shouldn't. Um, and, and that's the kind of pain that can lead to, to long-term uh, health or injury consequences. So what I had on Charlie Ramsey, I, I very much recognized as, as tendonitis um, and as something that was going to hurt a, a lot um, to finish things up. And it might cause my recovery time to be slightly longer, but it's not something that was going to cause me long-term health uh, or, or injury risk. Uh, so I, I managed it as best I could, altered my stride as best I could. Uh, the Ben Nevis descent, I, I, I essentially hopped most of the way. Um, it, as it, it got to the point where just I could still climb really well. And, and I, I even asked my pacers, can, can we somehow go up from Ben <laughs> Nevis to the finish? Is, is that possible? Um, but yeah, I, I just I could not descend. And, and so that final descent took me about uh, two hours longer than it should have. Yeah. And what goes through your mind when every step is just so painful? Because, well, I'm sure at that point you, you can't quit. You, you're nearly there. But do you have yeah, well, any kind of mantras that you repeat over and over? Yeah. The, and at that point, you know, the, the, the quickest way to quit is to just make it to the finish oh, line. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's always my... The, a great point in an ultra uh, when you you hit that, uh, but it's it's really just kind of one step at a time, uh, setting your sights on something that's uh, actually within grasp uh, in front of you, and and getting there, and then getting to the next thing, um, and and continuing to do that, and until the thing within grasp is the actual finish. And on that descent, a number of times, I let myself look all the way to the bottom and think, oh, it's still so far away. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's just a matter of um, chopping things up in, into manageable chunks. Yeah, yeah, definitely break it down and uh, you can achieve each one as you go. And I was just struck by, um, well, the eloquence really of your Instagram mini blogs where you said you went through this whole range of emotions of happiness and anguish and determination, despair and then triumph at the end. Um, yeah, so uh, that must have been one of the most anguishing and despairing moments for you, just so close to the end. Yeah, so, so for me, I think the the feeling of triumph came on uh, on top of Ben Nevis, and and then the uh, the bit of despair and anguish descending there um, to the the finish at, at the Glen Nevis Youth Hostel. So it, it, to me, the it, Ben Ben Nevis was the the bigger moment than the actual finish was. Once I reached the finish, I, I just kind of by that point I wanted to stop moving and get some food and sleep yeah and we'll come to I really want to talk to you about food so we'll come to that in just a moment but I've just popped up on screen the first Instagram post that you put up you put up this picture of you at the summit of Ben Nevis and um, it's a, a really nice photo from Stacey Holloway from way outside um, I, I must just credit her I, I said to her that I would just credit her in this so um, uh, basically uh, the way outside are outdoor events they do support um, as well um, and they're a company on the west coast of Scotland support endurance athletes and environmental campaigners they also do trail running and wild swimming guiding too so check them out wild um sorry wayoutside.co.uk and give them a follow it's um at wayoutside uk on instagram as well and if you're not already following john kelly on instagram as well then definitely give him a follow um at random forest runner as well um and i just wanted to just talk to you a little bit about why you chose this photo to sum up your whole uh the whole kind of epic challenge john because 
um, you look really knackered but also really happy at the top like elbow on this trig point and it's complete fog all around you can't see any view from Ben Nevis um, what what made you choose that photo in particular yeah so it's, it's kind of the uh, what you mentioned there the the mixture and, and the complexity uh, of what you can see in my face and my pose and uh, for me mentally if I just kind of think about different elements of that moment uh, I'm able to uh, pretty effectively relive it um, from those different contexts and feel um, the, each of those feelings that I, I had at the moment uh, that, that you mentioned the, the triumph and, and the despair and the happiness and the, and the anguish uh, they're all there and, and they're all kind of in my face um, and uh, if it, it's a matter of me kind of remembering what led up to that and being able to re-experience uh, each one of those individually. And um, we've just got some questions about that on the live chat. Um, Kelly Benedetti, uh, Benedetti says, um, seeing someone else achieve truly great things makes me realize I can achieve so much more in my own life than normal or average. So you've uh, inspired people there as well. Um, and then uh, Kate from Harrier Trail Running, um, she wants to know which one of the rounds was your favorite, um, but um, not necessarily on the grand round, but just in general, which one is your favorite? Uh to be honest, I, I think it would have been uh, Ramsey if it if it didn't try to kill me. <laughs> um, it's it, it was kind of my my first experience in the UK of feeling like I was really out there and remote and in a truly wild place. Um, you know, Patty Buckley and Bob Graham are, are great and they're beautiful and, and they both have their unique aspects. Um, but throughout the round, you know, each of them, you have four kind of transition points where you're crossing a road, you're able to resupply, hop in a van to warm up if you need to, change kit, whatever. Um, you're, you're kind of going through farmland and walking along fences and walls and, and whatnot. Uh, Ramsey, th there is none of that. Uh, I remember seeing a few um, rusted fence posts. There was a bothy that I stopped in um, near Loch Trigg that uh, looked like it had been abandoned in the 1930s, probably. Uh, and otherwise, there are two transition points, um, and those are just the points at which it is... Um, least inconvenient for people to hike in uh, new supplies for you. So there, there are no road crossings. Um, you, you cross train tracks a couple of times and, and that's it. So, so that feeling of just these grand mountains and remoteness is, is something that I really loved um, personally. So I, I hope one day I can experience that in slightly better circumstances <laughs> yeah yeah and I suppose because you've done on the previous round you did the paddy and you did the book Graham already so those were kind of known entities and then this was like oh the new ground breaking new ground and also Scotland is the well the closest the UK will ever get to those magnificent huge tracts of mountains in the USA um, so you must have felt like at home there yeah, absolutely, and it did remind me of, of some places I've been uh, in remote wilderness in the U.S. where, it, you know, the altitude is higher, um, but the prominence of the mountains uh, in in Scotland is, is really just as much. I, I mean, Ben Nevis uh, is about 5,000 feet, and Glen Nevis is, is sea level, pretty much. Um, so you, you've got a huge prominence there versus in Colorado, where there's all these 14,000 feet peaks. But once you go west of Denver, pretty much the entire state is above 9,000 feet. So there's, there's, it's, it's, it's kind of on the same scale. Uh, so I, I do, if I had to do it over again, I would probably do Ramsey first. Um, so that, uh, again, it's not as much of a dangerous situation being out there with limited support points uh, and, and also I, I, I would have 
uh, at least gotten Ramsey sub 24 and officially <laughs> completed my my big three completion. Oh no! Uh, whereas, You're not going to have to as, do it again, are you? <laughs> it, well, well, I'll have I'll have to do Ramsey at some point because oh, yeah. the, the big three <laughs> completion is getting each of the three under 24, and so I now have two sub 24 each for Patty and Bob, but I, I still don't have one for Ramsey. Ah, and would you be tempted to go for Finley's record? Yeah, he's he's uh, set <laughs> the bar pretty high there. <laughs> Uh, what Finley did is what a phenomenal athlete does in great conditions who is intimately familiar with the area. Uh, I mean, fin Finley lives there. He's been in those hills who knows how many times, and he knows every perfect line um, to, to get between those, those tops. So it, it's going to require... Um, quite the performance uh, for anyone to top that and especially looking at the fact that he did a solo and unsupported which just um, you know it, it kind of blows my mind what he did there yeah so let's, uh, yeah let's not tell say, Killian Jornet about that one hey <laughs> well all that to say that no I, I don't think I'll I'll be beating that uh, <laughs> I don't think honestly that that Killian would beat it unless to Killian took the time support. to to really go out there and learn the terrain uh, as uh, well as Finley knows it, which uh, is frankly probably not going to happen. Yeah, so probably the only person who be can beat that record is Finley himself, and he does have a, a penchant for going back and, and beating his own records. So right, right now, I, I would I would say probably so. <laughs> yeah. Maybe sometime in the future, um, there there will be someone else that kind of meets that criteria of. Uh, athletic capability and, and knowledge of the land. Yeah, well, we'll all be watching, um, but mainly watching Finley to see if he does it again a bit faster. Um, so, um, uh, just a, a like um, a question from Kelly Kelly Benedetti here. Um, she wants to know if you could pick John just one thing, the one thing that helps you succeed most in these long challenges, whether it's like your mantras or your training sessions or your refueling or your recovery strategy. She says, what would it be? What would this one thing be? Is there like one magic ingredient that makes John Kelly complete? these amazing things uh, I would say choosing the right amazing things mm -hmm. is a, a huge part of that uh, you have to want it uh, when you're out there uh, for that long and hitting uh, such extreme lows you have to want it badly enough to push through that uh, and so that's that was true for me uh, at Barkley. Uh, that was true for me in in doing this uh, and other things that I've done that you know maybe to be honest haven't been as challenging, um, but I also didn't want as badly. Uh, I I haven't done as well. Uh, so having that kind of personal meaning uh, and intrinsic motivation to these things is is huge. Uh, and, and when we have that, um, and when we're willing to, to work towards that, I, I think that we're all, we're all capable of doing much more uh, than we, we ever imagined that we could. Uh, so choose something meaningful, uh, set a big goal, and, and go after it. And even if you come up short, you've, you've probably gone farther than you ever would have otherwise. Mm, and even if you don't make it the first time, you can go again. I mean, like, you know, you did the grand round one time, you know, you, you, you sorted it out, you ironed out all the some difficulties, and then you went again and did it perfectly. Yeah, and, and so that's, uh, that's an approach that I've taken that I prefer, maybe isn't the best for everyone, that uh, if I have an ultimate goal in mind, I would rather just go for it and go big and fail once or twice uh, to get there quicker versus I could take a kind of a path that involves less failure and set small incremental goals and maybe succeed at a dozen smaller things on my way to success but that process takes much longer to get there so what I care about is the ultimate goal and, and I would rather um, fail a couple of times and get there than take twice as long with a, a number of small successes uh, along the way. Mm, 
that's really interesting that's that's definitely really interesting um and kelly is actually watching live right now and she says i love that answer it makes me rethink my plans and goals thank you so yeah i love that too actually it's making me rethink mine as well um and uh, yeah i do want to talk to you um before we go about what you're doing next but i just i must talk to you about food um <laughs> because uh Dai has a question here um he said what sugar sugar based slash fried treat did you have after the grand slam um so we, we must talk about your food here because i uh, really your instagram you're eating burgers you're going to mcdonald's you are um or, or pizza as well so you're you're definitely not a plant-based athlete and, and I want to know your thoughts about that as well but but yeah you're fueling you're fueling on junk food like uh ha, ha, like is that normal for athletes or like is this just a, a thing that you found works for you over the year over the years yeah so I mean you need a uh, quick easy to to digest um, calories that, that can be converted to fuel uh, and so that is uh, carbs and, and largely sugar, um, it, you know, things that are low on fiber. Um, that it's, it's not exactly a, a diet that you would want to follow in, in everyday life, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but really, there, there's kind of, um, there's, there's quality food, and then there's um, food that's not good um but your body can convert to fuel and then there's just junk calories and then there's nothing and so you know any of those things are, are better than nothing mm -hmm. and in something of this length uh the key is to be able to, to keep getting food down to keep um converting that into fuel um to keep resupplying your body with what it needs uh, and of something with this length, that's that's even going to include meal replacement. You know, I'm I'm out there for for five plus days. No one has ever survived on uh, gels and energy bars for five plus days. Yeah, that would be um, horrible. So, yeah, so I I did have pizza and fish and chips and and cheeseburgers and all sorts of other things uh, whenever uh, the opportunity uh, arose for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's yeah r really a matter of, of keeping a steady stream of calories going in uh, whatever works for you um, and uh, keeping keeping those energy levels up mm -hmm. and because um, a lot of athletes that we've seen like probably over the past five years or so are, are trying out more plant-based diets as athletes so is that something that you personally considered yourself or, or do you do you not find that that works for you um, it's, uh, you know, I, I think everyone, uh, as far as fuel goes, uh, finds, needs to find what works best for them, uh, and that includes uh, what works best for them as, as far as refueling and also what works best as, as far as their lifestyle and, and personal choices go. Um, so that's not something that I've explored. I in general not much that I eat out there um, in terms of carrying with me is meat uh, largely because uh, I, I don't want something to go bad and I end up with food poisoning um, in the <laughs> yeah. middle of something so uh, really the only meat I have is stuff that I might have uh, at support points or um, again kind of in this case between the rounds uh, so if, if you can find you know you have to start with with whatever your 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 personal choices are um regarding diet and and find something that you can build upon that uh to to meet the energy requirements that you need out there and that's certainly doable um if if you're completely plant-based plenty of people have done it um that's just not something that i have explored it'd be interesting to would you consider exploring it because i mean some athletes have gone down that route and they found their performance is even enhanced um so is that something that you w might be interested in um i'm i'm pretty comfortable um with my my current approach and uh it's come from a lot of uh, experience and experimenting with what works best for me um so uh and, and until that changes i'll i'll stick with that yeah Fair enough. And uh, there was a really nice post on Instagram of you um, tucking into what you called your Gordon Ramsay round, <laughs> which I did a double take. I was like, 
I, I think it's Charlie. I think he's got the name wrong. And then I realised that this was the, an afterwards post. And, and there's a lovely picture of you with a full English breakfast and a scotch egg and Eccles cakes and some kind of sausage roll and then some... Like, oh, no, no, it was, it was Welsh cakes. Oh, Welsh cakes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was key. You know, I had the... Uh kind of the dessert item or sorry the breakfast item from uh each of the three countries that i, I ventured each through country oh there you go so you've got the scotch egg you've got the welsh cakes and then um so is it a sausage roll on the uh on so, the other so, one? so so there was a uh, welsh cakes full english uh scotch egg and, and then i threw in an american apple pie oh, um, okay. for, for dessert uh-huh awesome um and chloe mason on the live chat wants to know what about beer uh, more of a whiskey person myself. Um, you know, I, I don't drink uh, while I'm I'm actually out there and doing these things. And, and a lot of the things that I would enjoy in everyday life, uh, I definitely would not uh, eat during the fact. I, I, I enjoy spicy food. Uh, definitely would not eat spicy food uh, <laughs> while doing this. Uh, and also, these multi-day things, I don't know if it's from breathing through your mouth uh, for so long uh, in those kinds of conditions or um, what it is or if it's from what you're eating uh, but I, I doing these I, I tend to end up with with tongue ulcers and I know a number of other uh, runners that have experienced the same thing on, on multi-day uh, uh, races or events uh, so after the fact for a few days until those heal up I I'm also kind of limited and I can't eat a lot of the things that I really want to eat um, and I'm largely kind of limited to, to yogurt and ice cream which you know that's shame. fine as long as there's <laughs> enough ice cream that's a shame um, and I definitely want to talk to you about this invention that you have made and I think this is what Di Wilson is talking about when he says what sugar based slash fried item did you eat after the Grand Slam um, so yeah tell us about the crispy bow um, <laughs> people can google so, this if they want more <laughs> y yeah so this is something that I, I actually created geez I think five years ago now um before one of my big races i, I just kind of had this vision in my mind of uh where i come from so crispy cream uh is um really big uh where where i grew up it, it's from north carolina uh, originally uh and then there's also a, a restaurant called bojangles which uh kind of does southern uh cajun food and, and so i had this idea of of combining the two and, and creating a, a sandwich that was uh, two Krispy Kreme donuts uh, with a Bojangles Cajun filet patty <laughs> in between them, um, which, uh, you know, depending on what you use for the uh, two donuts, it, it's it's quite good. Um, it, you know, surprisingly, everyone who has tried it has, has come away uh, really? pleasantly surprised. Um, so your counterpart in the U.S., um, Ethan Newberry, oh, yeah. uh, the ginger runner. <laughs> there, there's a YouTube video of him oh, out there. Uh, eaten try one. Well, Do I have to eat one? <laughs> no. So so actually, Ethan's Ethan's vegetarian. So oh. we had a modified version <laughs> uh -huh. for him uh, that replaced the patty, but he did enjoy it. Um, and so I've I've kind of created variants of these uh, wherever I've traveled to and, and raced. There's there's one uh, I made in Hawaii after Kona. Uh, the, the malacat, which is uh, a, a, a malasada with uh, chicken katsu um, in, in the middle, um, which was another really good one. Uh, there have been some epic failures uh, as well, uh, and I decided it was time I, I create one in the UK. Uh, this was something finally worthy of it. So uh, it, the the natural uh, uh, thing here um, seemed to be uh, fish and scones. Or fish and scones. Sorry, Why not? If, uh, no, there's a debate over how you pronounce that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, it, it it was one of those that's good, but it wasn't greater than the sum of its parts. Oh, sadly. Really? So you know, I, I would still rather enjoy those uh, by themselves. <laughs> and, and, and I just put a picture of it up on the screen. So it's a, it's a scone with a, a fried fish, like a battered fish, in the middle. Am I right? Yep. 
Yeah, okay. and then there's some red stuff underneath the fish between the two bits of scone. Oh, like. yeah, the, the, is that the, jam the or tomato the, ketchup? The, the jam and the cream are there. Oh, the jam and the cream. Oh, yes, yeah, so there's it's, the it's, cream it's on one top. Of the, it's one of the key elements is the mixture of the, the sweet and savory. So you've, you've got to have that in there. Um, although I'm starting to discover that I don't think it's the sweet and savory that makes it good. It's the sweet and spicy. Uh. Uh, and so that's why you have like the, the Cajun um, patty is is really key. So yeah. I, I need to find something in the UK that can can spicy. add that element to it. Oh, maybe yeah. a curry, like some curry yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, like a tikka, and, and, chicken tikka. Yeah, and that that, that would also um, you know allow the, uh, the the plant based group to uh, to get on board there. Well, a chicken tikka. Well, not not a chicken <laughs> tikka, but there there are plenty of curries. Yeah, that aubergine are, are, curry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or maybe like you know, like there's a traditional donut we have in the UK. It's not like the American one. It's kind of much more doughy, and there's jam in the middle. You could get like half and half that, and yeah. then put that in there. That could well, be a well, point two version. Some someone did recommend uh, Victoria sponge with uh, chicken tikka masala in the middle, and wow. the Vic tikka which uh, I've got to give them points just for the name on that one. So Yeah, that's awesome. And I just love how you've dedicated an entire blog post to this. Um, and so if you Google Crispy Bow, it comes up with this like huge long blog post that John's done of like, there's this and there's this and there's this and there's pictures and there's like, and then you've done one that's is really funny. It's got two cookies on and the cookies are, there's half white and half uh, brown cookie, like half, half. And you've just written underneath that it's really important that one cookie is brown on one side and then the other cookie is brown on the other side and I'm just like that attention to detail just just makes me crack up it's absolutely fantastic you've got to go yeah, so that, on it. <laughs> that, that's that's the New York City variant and New York City has uh they call them black and white cookies that uh, uh, are very big there yes oh well we have to have one of them but uh, if anyone goes to New York definitely have one of those <laughs> and Di who asked you the question in the first place he's actually watching and he says thanks Claire and John for those answers that was really funny um but Hannah Baisley has said she's gone right off you <laughs> Chloe Mason is making a sick face but Guy says a man after my own heart <laughs> so you as some fans of the, the crispy bow and and some not so <laughs> enamored <laughs> yeah I, I think a, a mixture of intrigue and disgust is the, uh, <laughs> the appropriate reaction to it. So. I, I think it's brilliant. It's funny. And I love the debate you're having with Damien Hall about this cups of tea business as well, because uh, I think a cup of tea would wash down one of these crispy bows just right on. Um, do you not think? <laughs> it, perfectly. Bojangles makes some of the best sweet tea there is. So, you know, the, that, oh. that would go down right after it. Awesome. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, well, thank you for introducing the crispy bow into my life and into the lives of so many other people. Um, and, uh, and now uh, it would be really cool to know uh, about the future. So you've, you've only just done this thing and three people are asking you questions about the future here. So I'm very sorry about this, but <laughs> Arlene <laughs> says, um, uh, he, she says, awesome. I believe John has previously run many road races. Um, for example, the Marine Corps Marathon and the London Marathon. Does he now prefer trail running to road running? And does he plan on returning to the US anytime soon? Um, what events are in the pipeline for him? She's she's from the United States, so that's why she wants to know if you're coming back. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll eventually be back there. Um, we'll have to see how things go with the company that I, I moved over here for. and. Uh, the, the COVID-19 situation has obviously thrown things up in the air a bit, but um, I, I will be back there, um, I, I expect, with, within the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and yeah, I've, I've always had a, a preference for trail running, but do enjoy uh, challenging myself in a number of different uh, modalities, uh, I guess. Uh, I would still like to see kind of if I dedicate a serious training block to to marathon what i can do there um maybe wrap up the the world marathon majors i'm, I'm still missing tokyo and, and chicago um but i i have a i have a lot more ideas than i have time to do them uh we'll say so it's it's a matter of, of figuring out uh which ones will fit together um the the best and, and which are the the most meaningful to me 
Yes, definitely. Especially from what you said earlier, things have to be meaningful. Um, and and Dai, uh, he wants to know that um, now the Dragon's Back race has extended to six days, does that interest you even more? Um, like he wants to know if you're going to put your name down for next year. But I'm thinking, seeing as what you've just said about Scotland, the Cape Wrath Ultra might be more of one for you. Uh, so dragon's back looks like an incredible race um over some some beautiful terrain uh it's it's one that definitely is is intriguing to me uh i'm not to be honest as as much uh pulled to the idea of a stage race as i am to uh the multi-day continuous format where people kind of have to figure out the sweep and eating thing as part of their strategy uh so uh you know races like tortoise yacht for example um where it's you know start to finish w one shot uh so I, I haven't fully formed my plans for next year again i, I have a, a number of of ideas and i'll have to to trim them down uh into something that's actually feasible and allows me to perform as well as i want to on them uh i, I expect i'll I'll finish that up later in the year as as for right now uh, we have a, a baby coming here in a few weeks so uh, kind of just uh, not not focused on uh, that planning the running planning uh, for right now and uh, just uh, relaxing and, and focusing on that oh congratulations that's great news um, and and how you. what total of kids will that bring you to uh, that that will be number four. Wow! Yeah, I thought you had three kids. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, congratulations! That's a wonderful Thank news. You. Brilliant stuff. Wow! I don't know how you have time for all these things. <laughs> um, so, um, so well, yeah. Congratulations to your wife and uh, and your other three kids. That's great. Um, and so I. Do have a final uh, question here um, from Simon Lakin, who's another new patron of mine. So welcome to you, Simon. Um, he, he says hi, Claire, and everyone. Really looking forward to this interview with John. Um, he might not be able to catch it live. So my question for John is: Would you consider trying to retake the Pennine Way FKT, or would you ever consider like the challenges of the double Bob Graham, the double Paddy, or the double Charlie Ramsey round, like Nikki Spinks? Uh. So those those things are all in that list of ideas um, that I, I currently have. Um, the the Penine Way uh, definitely near the top, which uh, may have been there, regardless of, of whether Damien had taken it or not. Um, that's that's one of those that I. Uh, there are certain things I've done that I, I want to be sure that I've I've done my best and uh, really kind of set a, a benchmark there, and and that's that's one of them. Uh, so that is high on my list. Um, the the doubles, uh, in particular double Bob, um, is quite appealing to me. Uh, so we'll we'll again have have to see what I I can fit in. Yeah, well, that would be amazing to watch you do such things. Um, and um, yeah, it was it was it was um, it must have been a bit gutting to do the Pennine Way FKT and then just have Damien Hall like the following week just go for the record in the other direction and and go a bit faster. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah. we were we were both aware of each other's plans, and yeah. uh, that's that's part of this. You, you know, I I kind of I, I hope that what I did enabled him to. Uh, partly enabled what he did and if uh, at least enabled him to uh, set the bar higher and and now that he's done that uh, that's great motivation for for me and others to uh, again uh, try to push it a, a, a bit beyond that even and would you go um, north to south this time um, like Davian and like the and like the pre the original record y yeah like like Mark Hartley um, so I I'll have to put some more thought to fully decide on that, but originally Damien and I were going to race in opposite directions, and so I'd already made my plans and my paces and whatnot for south to north. Um, I, I do think, uh, so south to north you actually lose just very small amount of elevation, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that there is uh, a huge um, mental uh, psychological advantage to getting the toughest parts of it out of the way early the the sheviots are just right from the start if you're going north to south yeah. you get over crossfell within the first hundred miles uh and and so that's that's quite appealing uh to mm -hmm. to do that 
Yeah, um, yeah, I'm going to support, you know, Sabrina Vergi. She's mm -hmm. going to do a ladies record uh, north to south um, uh, in a couple of weekends time. And I'm going to support her in a camper van. So um, really looking forward to that. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see yeah. you do it north to south as well. Um, yeah, maybe next year. Yes, yeah, so she'll, she'll do great. I'll, I'll look forward to that. Yes, yeah, well, hopefully I can film a bit and, um, and yeah, give her some credit for, for what she does. It's absolutely amazing. Um, uh, fantastic. So uh, that's great. Thank you so much, John. Um, uh, that's everybody's questions answered. That's good. And uh, we just have a comment from Neve who says um, she watched a video of you, John, running the spine this year. Um, she says, great stuff and congratulations on the new baby coming. Um, so... Yeah, so everybody has really enjoyed the chat. And I'd just like to say thank you again, John. And um, uh, yeah, could you just tell everyone like um, how they can follow you, like Instagram, blog, like what's the best way to, to see what you're doing next? Uh, yeah, so I, I have a blog, uh, randomforestrunner.com. Uh, most of my social media links are there, um, but on Instagram and uh, whatnot, I'm also randomforestrunner. Uh, so uh, my kind of adventure report for this will go up on my blog eventually uh currently I, I have posts kind of outlining my my why for doing these things as well as uh the hartley slam as a whole which was the grand round combined with the penine way record uh and as you mentioned earlier i've, I've set this up um both of them uh to to raise funds for the stephen lawrence charitable trust uh, which is, is still ongoing, uh, and you can find links there for that or just by going to Just Giving uh, and, and searching for Hartley Slam. Uh, and this is an organization that uh, helps uh, disadvantaged youth uh, kind of uh, seek and, and pursue the, the careers of their choice and, and get off to a better start in life. And uh, as we mentioned, I'm soon to be a father of four, and so uh, this is... Uh, something that I'm, I'm quite passionate about and uh, kids being able to, to have a, a bit of a, a fair start um, in these opportunities, which uh, as runners, uh, I think uh, we, we can kind of appreciate everyone having the same starting line. Definitely. I think that's absolutely fantastic. It is a brilliant charity. So if you've not already gone and, and donated there, then definitely go head to John's blog, head to his Instagram and, and find the link there. Um, it's a just giving link, isn't it? I'll put it in the show notes of the podcast and also in the film description below as well. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, John. I just there's, um, there's lots of comments coming in just saying thank you. So I'll just read a few out to you just so that you can um, just uh, see who's been um, inspired by you tonight. So Chloe Mason says, congratulations on all your achievements, John, especially those during lockdown. Great interview, all the best. You are an inspiration. Looking forward to watching this space. Thank you all very much. <laughs> there's more <laughs> so <laughs> john gardner says this was a great interview john and claire well done um well done all around <laughs> so yeah that is that's very good john uh john gardner well done um kelly benedetti says really interesting and entertaining thank you um di wilson says thanks great interview john thank you for all your answers really inspiring all the best for the new arrival and um adrian orange um put some clapping hands um so thanks very much john <laughs> thank you uh enjoyed the chat um Thank you all uh, very much for, for listening in and, and for the great questions. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you so much, John. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk to you next time. Um, yeah, next time you do something amazing. So we'll keep track of you on Instagram. Uh, and do you know what? Next time I might, seeing as you've said that Ethan Newbury has done your um, crispy bow challenge thing. Next time we chat, um, I'm going to do one of them. So I'll, I'll have one on screen and, <laughs> and you can watch me eat some hideous <laughs> creation, your, hide your latest hideous creation. I, I promise to eat it in front of you. <laughs> that, thank you. It will, uh, the, 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 it will be quite entertaining, I'm sure. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, John. Um, and I'll let you go now. It's been fantastic to talk to you. Um, and good night. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>